Have you ever found yourself in a conversation that you knew you just didn't have time for? Just recently at our last monthly mobile food bank, I arrived at the church that morning, as I usually do on a Monday morning. And sure enough, one of our regulars, I'm going to call him Jim, that's not his name, but just roll with me. Jim was here waiting for me. So I go to unlock the door, I say hi to Jim, and he says, just the man that I was waiting to talk to, which is a scary way to start off a conversation. And it turns out he was simply trying to figure out where the actual food bank was going to be because we've been doing it over at the high school for quite a while, but we know with school starting, we're going to have to transition back here uh, in these coming months. But so that was, that was the crux of the, the initial conversation. But you know when someone just kind of lingers a little bit and you could tell there was something more, something a little bit more. Well, it turns out I had, like any of us, a million things that I felt like I needed to do. There's a lot to get done on Mondays before we then launch into the task that is the monthly mobile food bank. But I could just tell. And so, reading that situation, I stayed a little longer. And then I stayed a little longer. And it turned out that Jim and I ended up talking for about an hour together. And it was a great conversation. And in that conversation, I got to really connect with him on a level that I never get to connect with someone like that during the actual food bank. And this is one of our regulars. You see, both of us had to take time from what we probably should have been doing, could have been doing, needed to do, and maybe even wanted to do in order to form this new connection with each other. We had to listen to one another and have this conversation. The video you just saw was to kind of set up where we're going here in the book of Acts. And instead of teaching or me giving a recap of the first couple chapters, I thought that was way cooler because it has animation and uh, in a different voice. But what's happening, where we're going to go in our text into Acts chapter 3 today, is that everything is centered in on Jerusalem. And the resurrected Jesus is there and he's teaching his new community, what we would call the church, how they are going to be on the move, because they are now going to be filled with His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and they are essentially becoming, they're in process of becoming mobile temples. And I want you to, throughout this Acts time that we'll be in for the next so many weeks, I want you to remember that the church is mobile temples. So they're going to be these mobile temples, a unified family, and a family specifically that is designed to bring peace and justice and love to the world. And it's going to begin in Jerusalem, and it's going to move out to Samaria and Judea, Judea, and then eventually all the nations, to all the world. And this group of Jesus' new people are found in Jerusalem learning how to live in this new community of the way. See, they haven't been called Christians yet. Okay, That'll come later. They are just participants in this, what was called the way, and specifically the way of Jesus. And they're figuring out how to live as Jesus instructed and feeling out this process of learning how to live as the Spirit leads. And so we're going to dive into a pretty familiar passage for many of us this morning. And as we do that, I want to encourage you to open yourself up just just for a second to experiencing this account, account through a different lens. The lens of those that we would consider not privileged. Maybe people that might be on the outside looking in when it comes to socioeconomic status in the world. Because sometimes it's easy to put us just in the context of always kind of the hero of the story, right? That we do that. I like to do that when I'm reading really cool stories like Lord of the Rings or something like that where we're going to be Frodo, right? We're going to be somebody cool. But I want to dive into this with that in mind. That we want to consider those that might be a little more of the least of these. So this is going to be in Acts chapter 3. This is Peter heals a crippled beggar is what the heading would be. You can follow along up here on the screen says this, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. And each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently. And Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. 
in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, he stood to his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. See, all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized that he was the lame beggar that they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. I think we would be too. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. So this morning, and as we really dive into this look at Acts over the next so many weeks, a few questions for us to consider where we're heading. So if we truly are part of this new community of mobile temples, the question is, what should we be doing? Essentially, how do we live in and effectively participate in God's kingdom that is now being ushered in here on the earth. So Peter and John here are often together in Scripture. They were partners in the fishing business. Back in Luke 5, we would find that. And they prepared the last Passover for Jesus. In Luke 22, we would know that. And then, if you remember this great account that we get to every March or April, they were the two that ran to the tomb together on Resurrection Sunday. And I love it that John, because he's writing, always makes sure to put himself there first because I think there's a little bit of friendly competition going on here. But Peter and John were also, they were Jewish men and they followed the pattern of Hebrew prayer times even as they were becoming followers of the way, followers of the true Messiah. They were becoming Christians. And these prayer times that they were observing were traditional and had been practiced for centuries. You might remember this famous guy in the Old Testament named Daniel. Hopefully a few heads nod, because if you don't know that, you got to go, you need to go to promised land right now. Okay. And there was this guy named Daniel, and he prayed three times a day specifically. And scholars tell us that the stated times for worship were early morning, okay, for prayers. There was the ninth hour, which is what we hear about here, 3 p.m., which is kind of mid-afternoon, and then evening at sunset. So this rhythm and routine to life was cemented in them to have a pattern of prayer in their lives and to observe this routine with diligence. And I believe that an established rhythm of margin is one of the most difficult things for us to do today. We are multitaskers to the core and we are always running behind and we're and even in the midst of running behind, we're trying to cram in more errands and more things to do. And it almost feels like a point of pride, right? As at least an American, because I'm an American, that's all I really know. But it almost seems like a point of pride, right? That, well, I was able to squeeze in those few more things to do because more, accomplish, I got to do more. That's ingrained in us. And it creates a lot of commotion for us. It's an unsettling thing. And it makes a lot of noise around us. But we should be efforting to ground ourselves in patterns of break, and of downtime. And it's, it's times like these that we're currently living in right now that we realize that the troubles of life around us are a bit more large than we are. They're bigger than what we are. And we need to trust in the strength of God to help us to keep focus so that our lives can stay kind of on track moving down the line. And so when we talk about margin, I mean, I put this up here, establish a rhythm of margin. Well, I think one way we talk about margin a lot in our lives is personal finances, right? And if you know anything about trying to get some margin in your personal finances is that you can operate for a while without any margin, but eventually that catches up with you, right? Because we always know, I talked about with this with Jeff recently, eventually there's a tire issue, right, with your car. Eventually there's the car repair. Now, I'm fortunate. I've got my good friend Floyd. I feel like I have a mechanic on call. How cool is that? Thank you, Floyd. But there's still the car repair that you still have to pay for parts, even if you got a good hookup guy. There's always that hot water heater that's going to go out when you least can afford it. Now let's flip to the positive. There's also some things in life that you need margin for so you can enjoy, right? Maybe you need the new shoes or the new clothes. Raylene and I know that world. 
Uh, we love that a little too much, maybe, but that's cool. Okay? But you need the new outfit, maybe. Maybe you're just getting the kids back to school. Oh, goodness, backpacks, all that. You've got to buy this stuff. Or maybe you want to do a cool vacation. Maybe you want to take that motorcycle trip out west and have a good time. And so you need some margin so that you can currently enjoy things and have some peace, and then even future fulfillment in your life. So what's margin look like actually played out in our schedules, in our life? For me, margin looks like third wave coffee shop. And I know Maya picks on me because I'm there often. But third wave is a place for me to have margin. It's a space for me to read. It's a place for me to study. Sometimes I'm even writing sermons there, believe it or not. And I get great ideas from the conversations around me. Sometimes it is just a place to check out for a little bit. To sit in stillness with a good cup of coffee and look out the window at beautiful downtown building. Amen? Beautiful downtown building? Yeah, we got the building folks here. Woo! Oh, the building people are laughing. No, it is. There, there's the beautiful clock I look at. That's, yeah, across at the mall. Thing. Eh, you know, that's what it is. But it's a, it's a place for stillness and it's a place for conversation and interaction that I know I have to have. Because my margin has to include other people. Now, maybe for you, that's not the case. My dad had margin in his life that I... Never understood as a kid, but now I get as an adult. Every Saturday morning, my dad would disappear for about three hours. And he would go to the famous Lee Township dump and take our trash from the week and take it to the dumping station. And then he'd make the journey over to what we called Six Mile Corner. There is no Six Mile where we lived. It was the corner of M30 and M20. And he'd go get his Saturday paper. Now this was a seven-mile round-trip thing. And Lee Township dump is a famous place, but it it's not that famous, okay? It wasn't that long. And he would take three hours to make this trip around our community. See, that was my dad who worked a really, uh, man, he worked a lot of hours. He had a salary job working 70 hours a week. This was his call. This was his downtime, a chance to check in with God, check in with his own feelings and what was going on in his life, to maybe linger a little longer at the dump or at that store, just talking, having a little conversation, finding out what's happening in our little community. See, that was important. It was that chance to slow down a bit and create margin in His world. And if you're struggling to do this, I want to promote one more time. You already heard it during announcements. But this book study that we're launching into is really about this concept. It's a little bit of taking time and slowing down to focus on what's happening here. What's going on to find some margin in our routine in the craziness of life. Now Peter and John, back to our text, I mean, they went to pray. They had this routine thing down. And they also had room for something a little else. Because they had learned the need for margin in their lives, lives and in order to experience real fulfillment and meaningfulness in their life. Which if you're at all like me, which is a scary thought for you probably, but are we all desiring a little more fulfillment and meaningfulness in our lives? And the cool thing is, this is all done by participating in the selfless way of Jesus. And so as we continue on, you know, in the text, they approach the temple, right? And they were there near the beautiful gate. And in the Greek, original Greek text, beautiful means happening or coming at the right time. And I think that's important. We don't usually go to original language stuff because I'm not going to bother you with that. And, and frankly, it's sometimes it's a little over my head. But I think it's important here because in my life, the good things seem to always have a, a knack for coming at the right time. Or maybe it's where you're just hanging by a thread. And man, it better show up. And so this beggar, upon them approaching, asked Peter and John for money. And they have none to give. Which is weird, right? Because we can't imagine not having really any money. I mean, I might not carry cash, but I've got money if I really need to access it. But if you know anything about Acts, especially Acts 2.42, a famous line out of the passage just before this, is that these early Christians, these early believers, were sharing everything. And I think it's likely by 3 p.m., whatever they had for the day, they may have already shared and given away to one another that were part of their community. And so for Peter and John, at that point, it would have been easiest to just walk away, right? Like, hey, 
ain't got no silver and gold. We're on our way to pray. I'm going to get out of here. And I admit, as I encounter some folks that are asking for money, seeking charity, and I know it's a judgment call, but I tend to walk by a lot of that too. And I hope you won't judge me for that because I won't judge you for that either. Because it's a real challenging tension in our lives of when to help and when not to help. And that said, I do think that we should seek to help when folks are genuinely in need and, and help them make steps forward in their life. When we, uh, Kristen and I got married, we went to Chicago because we only had a long weekend. We had three days to get away because life was busy. Is it, is it ever not busy? Um, it just seems like there's always something. So we go to Chicago, and during our time in Chicago, we, we really just kind of putzed around and ate really good Chicago-style pizza, because that's my love language, basically. And we did a little shopping, and so we were on the Magnificent Mile, and we encountered a lot of folks seeking charity, asking for money. And as we engaged with these folks, a couple of them, multiple days in a row, you got to hear more of their story each time. And some of them, you know, it was like the fish story, where it kind of probably got a little bigger each time. It was a little embellished. But I kept being just struck by their stories and then wondering, how did they get to this spot in their life? How did they get here? To where they're asking for money every day. And then think about our text here that we read. You know, I wonder questions about this man. It's like, who is carrying this beggar to the temple each day? Who put him there? And then I wonder, was he being somehow kind of exploited? Because it says people brought him there every day. And why was the man expecting money in response to his situation? Is that really the only help that he wanted? Did he just want money, really? Was this somehow a conditioning of his spirit over time that he just knew his role and his place in life? It was just to ask for money. I mean, was everything for him just a simple transaction? Is that all it is? I see you, you give me money, go on your way, we move along with life. Is that all it is? Just a well-known business deal? And then I think about in my own life then, is that still something that we just see and understand today? That if I do have a couple bucks and I actually take the time, like here you go, it's a transaction, we move on, you move on, things are okay. You see, with no social system in place to help, partnered with a belief that still sometimes creeps into our world too, with the belief of many religious people that a physical problem meant that God was repaying you for sin, which is the problem with retributive justice, by the way. That's a side note for some other day. See, the socioeconomic outsiders in the first century were extremely charity dependent. And luckily, Peter and John did stop. And they were willing to engage the man who asked them for funds. And I think that says something about noticing people around us. I put up here on the screens, engage the overlooked. It's reaching out to them. It's using the resources God has given us to bless others and doing so in our loving devotion to Jesus Christ. And the truth in this account is that the man thought he was in need of a few coins. I mean, it tells us that he expected money. This was the expected exchange. It was a transaction. I ask you for money. You give it to me. You go on to pray. We're all good. However, this man's greatest need was to be seen and ultimately to be connected to Jesus and his community. It was to be truly looked at and to be truly cared for. And that's what they say. Peter says, look at us. And it's an interesting line, isn't it? Look at us. Because I wonder then, where was the beggar looking? Was he looking somewhere else? And it doesn't take much jumping through that a little bit, and I'm reading into the text a tiny bit, that he wasn't looking at them. They had to ask him that he was probably beaten down by this situation. So much so that maybe he couldn't really stand to allow people to truly see him. And I encounter this even as I go about life here in Greenville. When I get on the trail and I do some walking or jogging or biking, I encounter a lot of people, and I've had this conversation with others that see the same thing. There are a lot of people that this is all they do when they're walking on our trail here in Greenville. A beautiful trail. They're not taking in the scenery. They're not looking at anyone. They just have their head down. And I make it a point of emphasis to simply try to just at least exchange a glance and a wave. Now on a bike, that's a little bit tricky because you've got to kind of yell as you're coming up on them a little bit further. That might startle them. I try not to startle them. 
but to make eye contact, to see them. Because to actually see them is to acknowledge that what we say around here, they matter too. To actually see them is to reestablish they're a human. They have personhood. It's to even help restore someone to their image bearer status that they've also been created in the image of the divine. I like to think about it like this, and if you're a Taylor Swift fan, she has a song called Invisible String. And I'm, I'm quoting Taylor here this morning. Invisible String, good tune. Raylene at least knows this. But it's to acknowledge that there actually is a bit of an invisible string that's connecting us as fellow humans. And so I want you to also notice in this text that this work, this miracle that happens in the text is done in the name of Jesus. And truthfully, it's because Jesus is the source of power for healing and for strength and compassion. And then we also believe that Jesus is the source of everlasting love and salvation. Welcome to the family. In a world that feels pretty frantic right now or maybe just distressed, with the virus still lingering and being around and part of our lives, even if it hasn't really reached Montcalm County hardcore, it's here. With all the political and social unrest around us, hopefully there's some heads nodding and you feel that, because if you don't, then I want to know how you're living your life, because you have ducked it all, that is cool. And there's a constant barrage of just negativity everywhere. It could be on the roadways, with people you will never meet in your life, and there is still negativity exchanged because We are all here. But we need to be even more aware right now and alert to the broken around us and alert to their greatest needs, which is really truly to be connected to each other and then ultimately, I believe, connected to Jesus Christ through the working of His family. And what Peter and John gave to this man in terms of compassion and healing in this account It's so cool that it ends up by this beautiful gate which was adorned with elaborate metals and all this beautiful architecture. But what they gave him was even more beautiful and more worthwhile than this beautiful gate. And it's truly a stunning account because it reflects the generosity of God that is flowing through the loving actions of His children. Now one truth about generosity is that you can't give away what you don't have. And I'm glad that you guys could echo that because I put in my notes, duh, right? That's a duh moment. Hello, you cannot give away what you don't have. But it's clear here that Peter and John, they have something to offer, right? It ain't silver and gold because they already gave that away. They offered that to their group, their community. Okay, But they have a deep trust that they belonged to Jesus Christ and His family. And that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit was living in them. And if you struggle to believe that this morning, I want to remind you that you do belong. That you are loved. And that absolutely you are called to share that same belonging with others. Henry Nouwen, a really great author and speaker, pastor, priest, he's got a title list that goes this long, but he says it like this, and you'll see it there on the screen. It says, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And this is a fundamental truth of your identity. This is who you are, whether you feel it or not. You belong to God from eternity to eternity. Life is just a little opportunity for you during a few years to say, I love you too. You see, you cannot be generous with what you have if you think God hasn't been generous with you. I'm going to repeat that one more time because I think that's one line in this message that everyone needs to hear a couple times. You cannot be generous with what you have if you think that God hasn't been generous with you. Instead, you end up being a bit self-centered and self-concerned and you're always just believing that you don't have enough. i got to get more from me. Even though, just like the prodigal story, which is a familiar one we're not going to dive into, but just that God, everything He has, Is already yours. It's understanding and knowing yourself as a loved person of special distinction and of promise and how that inevitably affects the way we live our lives with others. Because it reveals something to us when we see ourselves, man, I'm a person of special distinction. And we begin to see others as that as well. And we get the glimpse that humanity, 
just walking around in this skin suit means something. It means something. So have some confidence this morning, people. I want to encourage you with this. Have some confidence that the Creator of the universe is still the one who is creating new life in me and in you and in us together. Because as I've already alluded to many times, and maybe that's getting annoying because we know that this world we live in right now is strange, but we've seen how life lately remains characterized by the many things that we can't do. And maybe you guys are running into this because about every three days there's a new something that I'm like, oh, we can't do that right now. Oh, man. And it's something that I'm really looking forward to. I've been pondering what Christmas looks like. Maybe you have too because I'm a sucker for Christmas music and all things red and green and all that. But Christmas will be different, probably. And I'm getting a little bit frustrated with this constant reminder. But this week I was reminded, maybe you need to be reminded of this too, that it's not the question of what we can't do. It is really the question of what can we do. And when it comes to relating to others, to being generous with what you have, we don't have to be able to answer every difficulty or address every dilemma. And we don't have to heal every hurt. And we don't have to interject joy into all sadness. But the flip side of that is we cannot know a Redeemer who can do all and then still sit on our hands. It's not an option. Andy Stanley, and I've used this quote before, says it this way. He says, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. That, that one's easy for me because it sticks with me. It's a quick little turn of phrase. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And I know we've got a lot of people in this room you know, thinking about teachers are really good at that. Coaches. Parents, that's a tough job. Friends, mentors. You know What this means actually is expressing love through action, not just words, and how that leads to helping others realize their potential. And we have someone from our congregation that I'm going to remain, uh, they will remain nameless for this morning because they asked that to, to do that. But this particular person that was brought to my attention, I, they're the kind of person that serves a lot anyway, and they just, they just seem to care so genuinely about others. But a different person from our community at large had mentioned this member of our congregation and how this member of our congregation really helped a daughter grow up through her middle school, high school years and then really begin to flourish. And this particular member of our church has been doing this for about 20 to 30 years of doing high school and middle school mentoring that involves actual like help academically so that they can you know, get things done and really keep accelerating and moving through their school years. But it's also just simply being present during a major crisis point, which is middle school and high school, of a young person's life and helping them assimilate into the hope of being an adult and maturing. And this person gives a ton of their time on top of what their working life always was. And this same person actually continues today to help senior citizens that got left behind in school also learn how to read. Helping folks that are in advancing years that still don't read well. Can you imagine the flow of confidence and esteem that happens by even being a 75-year-old who learns how to read finally? Talk about validating individuals is that they matter. That's powerful stuff. That's somebody in our congregation. That's cool. That's exciting. And so the question for us that we have to answer is, when we think of this, generosity with what you have, well, what do you have? What do you have? It is an amazing story that we come across here in Acts 3. And it reminds us of the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, and it all points to how His people, His family, His community of followers are empowered by the Holy Spirit and are to be a living demonstration of His love. And Peter and John, they're there. They're part of this. And they don't take credit. They don't even try to claim credit. They simply just point to like, hey, it's this way of Jesus that we're living out. And we didn't read this text, but further down in Acts 3, verse 16, they're now inside the temple. And there's a crowd there. And Peter addresses them. And he says this. He says, Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. But faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through Him working in the lives of people that has fully healed this man. 
And then this healed man goes with Peter and John into the temple courts and he's praising God. And the people were filled with amazement. And again, I know what we're going through in our everyday lives right now. It's hard. We, we own that, right? The up and down of life right now feels a bit overwhelming and it challenges us. And if you're like me, again, you feel overwhelmed maybe right in this moment this morning. It's normal. But our focus, even in the midst of this turmoil around us and in us, is to walk in step with the Spirit of God which is residing in us and then to continue the practice of being mobile temples. Not immobile temples, not fixed temples, mobile temples on the move for the world to see. And this is what Jesus is getting at when he actually talks way back in the book of Matthew. I just want to remind you, this is the Sermon on the Mount. It's part of the Beatitudes. And he says this to this crowd that gathered. He says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. See, in this moment, Jesus is talking to a lot of ordinary, average folks here. And he later talks about what we would call private disciplines. Things like prayer, fasting, and giving money. And he talks about how the overtly, or maybe we call them elite religious folks, like to make that all a show. And it's not that those disciplines aren't good because they are good. They're just for personal benefit. And that's not what Jesus is getting at here. It's not for personal benefit. Jesus here is telling this group of people that there is work for them to do in order to shine light into darkness. And to keep flavoring their neighbors and their neighborhoods and their communities in this world with really good salt. It says, you are the light of the world. And what the world needs now is not more YouTube sensations. Even though my kids think so. We don't need more social media celebrities. We don't need more political pundits. We don't need more political keyboard warriors. Jesus affirms the world-changing and culture-shaping value of regular people who choose to consistently practice and participate in the ways of an extraordinary God and His love with real people in real time. So, as I always say, it's, it's a lot of words, right? I hope you're encouraged. But now, what's a few practical, actionable steps? Things that we can begin to do. we gotta, we got to do this to keep moving this way. And the first one, you see it up there, is C. And I think we're pretty good about that here. I think we have to have our eyes open. And I, I will, if I can pat you on the back, I will. I'll pat myself and you do the same. I think First Church does a pretty good job of opening our eyes to needs, to things happening around us. The danger for many believers is we just put up the blinders, right? I just want my little space. I don't want to see that because then I might have to think about it. I just want to go through my life like this. But I don't think we do that. That's why we can put little monikers like that on the wall because I don't think we do that. But you have to continue to be willing to see, to have your eyes open. The second thing is to help. I put on there, now. To help now. I had a conversation with someone this week from our church that's not here. I won't use names again because I forget to ask sometimes ahead of time. But I had a conversation with someone this week and we were kind of lamenting the fact that there's been a few people in our life where we just felt pressed like, we should go visit them. Man, well, I should go check in on them. Maybe go visit them in the hospital. And inevitably, we've got a million things to do. Our to-do list is always running longer. We've already talked about that. We just put more in it. And you miss those opportunities. And this one particular conversation was about that this person had passed away. And it hurts, right? I imagine you can think of that situation in your life right now. See, we have to participate in real time with real people because our belief, our faith must be lived out. And so that's the question to ask yourself. You know, when have you done that? And that, that should be a reminder that like that's the good thing to do in the moment. Help now. See the need. Feel the need. Go do it. Be part of it. But you're going to need some margin in your life. So quit filling up your calendar constantly. Learn to say no to a few things so that you can help now. 
Because it's easy to make excuses. Not taking the time in the moment. And maybe some of that is for us just a lack of desire. Because sometimes I do want to just kind of put up a blinder and I don't really want to help. Maybe it's a lack of willpower. But it should be a natural progression of our faith to help. Now, when we went through Philippians, we read about this, and I want to bring that back up. Paul, the Apostle Paul, says it this way, right? He says, For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to His good purpose. We talked about this in past weeks, but asking God to fix your wanter is as good a prayer as you can pray. Saying, God, give me the will to build margin in my schedule and then give me the opportunities according to your good purpose to help. Now. And our last one is go together. And I want to remind you of something that's in this text. The miracle really in this story doesn't happen when Peter spoke it. Maybe you caught this. It actually helped, happens when he helped him up. And then they go together. It's the action of being for each other. It's not just saying we're better together. It's actually being better together. We have to go with people. And towards the end of this miraculous story, we find the man that was healed clinging to John and Peter is what it says. It says he was clinging to them. I believe that's because even though there was some leaping and there was some excitement, those new ankles and those new feet needed some stability to help walk. I mean, he doesn't know quite how to really go about this standing up and doing everything. It kind of reminds me of when you've got a toddler, right? And that toddler's learning to walk. They're getting those first shaky steps. And they can do a few steps their own, right? But then they come crashing down and we don't want all those bumps and bruises. That's what's going on here. What if they would have just bailed? What if Peter and John were like, you're healed. We're out of here. Good luck. I don't think there's this scene in the temple where everyone's standing in amazement. See, Peter and John went to pray together. And they were shown someone to whom they could share. And I wonder for us if we are trying to do this alone too often when we should be working together, at least in tandem. Are we trying to do ministry by ourselves when it should involve others? And the opposite is true also because You'll notice we only get two of the disciples, right? So where are these other ones? You know, sometimes the the entire group didn't travel together to pray here is what we see, but I think we're also tempted to sometimes sit back. They got it. Somebody else will do the stepping out. Somebody else will handle it, and someone else will see this person through. But being a part of Jesus' community and living His selfless way isn't just found in that one time That checklist mark. It's not just a one-off specific moment. Rather, as we talked about in previous times, it's cultivated in the staying power. It's the continuing to ride along with others. It's going together. It's being together and it's staying together. And John and Peter, hear this. John and Peter allowed this man to hold on for a little bit longer. I'm asking you, will you do the same? Will you do the same? Let's pray together this morning. God, we are thankful for...